Well, uh, <laughs> welcome to the second talk of the of the session. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Giuseppe Mignone from University of Parma, and uh, he'll be working to give a talk about uh, the you know nonlinear potential theoretic methods, right? So, whenever are you ready? Okay, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a always a big pleasure to be in Barcelona. So, what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, sort of. Uh, um, let's say, okay, the, the, the purpose of this talk is more or less to give uh, ideas of how nonlinear potentials can be used to get uh, sharp regularity results for solutions. Okay, so let me focus on one particular problem, but then we, we see that uh, essentially the methods are more, more uh, at the center. So uh, we take an equation in the um, in divergence form like this. We assign, a, we assign data and we want to know best possible conditions on data guaranteeing, for instance, for instance, that the gradient is bounded. So it's just continuity of solution. So it's a very classical problem, but the best you can get. So, uh, so and I would like to show um, uh, how uh, potentials enter into non-uniformly elliptic operators. But first, let me talk about uniformly elliptic operators. So um, the model case is given by the Pila Plasian operator. And otherwise, any vector field satisfying these assumptions that are clearly modeled after the field of Russian and uh, uh, is, uh, I mean, is suitable for purposes. And these are classical assumptions after the chess so, But if you want to keep, uh, I mean, to keep mind in order, uh, just think of the field of Russian operator. Okay, there's not a lot of difference in terms of the results. Um, okay. Um, sometimes I will put a coefficient. But uh, the, the, the real emphasis is on data, is on the right hand side. Okay, when p is equal to two, we have a, so sometimes a nonlinear Poisson equation. And uh, this is a, a kind of result I'm going to talk about. It's a rather surprising one because this tells that you can bound the gradient point twice, the other is potentials, essentially as it were linear. So the strength of this result is that you don't need the, the equation is linear, so you don't need fundamental solutions. And uh, in particular, when you have good decay at infinity and you're on the whole RN, you can let capital R go to plus infinity. The, la the last guy disappears. This is actually a constant. This is what it matters when capital R goes to, it, in, you see, it must be there because when capital R goes to zero, this, is, this disappears and then it's DU less than itself. So it's a classical localization term. But otherwise, this condition, which is, uh, which is known for the Poisson equation, Holds for any possible nonlinear equation. What does this mean? That you can just forget the standard regularity theory and everything uh, is reduced to the Poisson equation in terms of the grid. Uh, uh, okay, this is the first uh, of a series of results that was largely debated in the community because uh, uh, the first result was for you and was by Kit Pelang and Mali and was via yeah, Wolf potentials. Then, um, to be there won the beats scale, other people try to prove the gradient estimate uh, via Wolf potentials. And uh, the question was other people believe that it was not true. <sighs> no, after two, so after, okay, Kipperang and Marie's paper is 92, 92, 92. And then they started uh, the, the paper of Tudinger and Wong is 99. And then they started thinking with also Verbitsky and other people to the gradient estimates, but in terms of Wolf potentials. Uh, of course, Wolf potentials and uh, uh, Ries potentials uh, coincide when P is equal to two. Actually, I didn't know all this, so I conjectured that the Wolf potential uh, gradient estimate was true when I started working on that. Then we, first we proved uh, with, uh, with Dutzer then it holds, but then we observed that something uh, very surprising holds in the sense that when P is different than two, you just add P minus one, and then the same estimate holds. So as a corollary, any gradient estimate on the Pila Plasian or any kind of equation follows from this. The Benedictus estimates, the Binance, uh, everything. Because you have completely linearized the equation, and there's no difference whatsoever. Between. Before it was nothing. <laughs> Take P equal to two, you get one. The first, the yes. right one for P plus two. Yeah, this was the first proof. Actually, the first proof goes via fractional estimates, via fraction of the Georgi iteration that uh, was at the same time a version of it developed by Kafferi and Basel, said in the same year. But this was in local problems. 
it was a fraction, but I will come back on this later on. So the importance of this estimate is that essentially you are reducing any quasi-linear equation to the Poisson equation. So if you want to know sharp results on the right hand side, you just forget about anything. For instance, Talenti's estimate they follow in one shot. Ivan is something a bit or this classical theory. I mean, they, they, are, they just follow from this. And uh, we did uh, this uh, for this range, then uh, very, uh, then this, uh, the gap was completed by Nguyen and Puck, and then we extended this uh, to the to the pila plasma system. And the proof is completely different in this case. Uh, okay, Talenti says maybe you go up to the boundary because you need by simplification. You know that he has a U and F, and then uh, F determines U. And this is, this, is, uh, this is the same because now you have F and U, and then you go back. Actually, Talenti's estimates were already implied by Kit Balagan and Malik. But which phase of estimates are Talenti? Gradient estimates, for instance, for measured data problems, essentially. Uh, actually, Talenti, what Talenti does is an estimate of the rearrangement here, the real quantity. But that quantity, if you analyze, is the rearrangement of the risk, is, is equivalent to the rearrangement of the risk potential. So this is stronger because this is pointwise. So this is really the fundamental solution that appears in nonlinear problems. I don't know what you mean. And this, yeah, and this implies everything. Uh, I mean, whatever you know for the Poisson equation, and this is actually a, a different formulation a totally intrinsic formulation where there's no P involved here. You see, it's exactly what you get here. Why I like this formulation? Because uh, try, if you try to solve this field, and this is a non-elliptic, so it admits infinitely many solutions. How do you do? It's classical Bogoski's lemma. So if you go to Bogoski's proof, then you essentially apply something which is ironic. So I1 is an integration cancels the divergence and F is denoted by I1. But after under the sign of divergence is A of D. Of course, this is you, you cannot apply this for that because this has infinitely many solutions. Nothing guarantees that it refers to that one. But this is the, the, the <coughs> thick regularity theory playing here below. And uh, this confirms a long-standing conjecture of Urax. Because we also, we also have conjectured that the best conditions on the right, that condition, that the sharp conditions on the right hand side in order to guarantee that the gradient is bounded was P independent, was independent of P. And on the right hand side, you get a quantity which is P independent. So you assume that this quantity is bounded, this implies that this is bounded and uh, this, is, uh, this is confirmed. Okay. Actually, it's a general phenomenon because uh, if you consider any general non-uniformly elliptic operator, this is a paper of Baroni. So anything under the sign of divergence, you take the, 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 this kind of operator, which is uniformly elliptic under this assumption. It's a classical object considered in the literature. Then you can estimate what is under the sign of divergence with the risk potential according to this, this, this principle. Okay. And this is an example of how nonlinear potentials can help you in regularity. So, sorry. Yeah. So now the G is outside the interval, and before it was inside the interval. Oh, no, no. It's a, Hello. yeah, it's, a, it's okay. convex. So you can get, take it convex. You can okay. put it inside the, or outside. Okay. You, you can put it, actually, it's a good question because you can put it anywhere you like by reversing equalities, okay. like a, a sort of reverse inequalities, mm -hmm. I think, for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, corollaries, uh, corollaries. This is a theorem of Stein. Uh, oh, oh, Jesus. I did something very wrong. Perhaps it's because there's like, there's, I know one of the buttons, perhaps uh, this okay. one screws it all up. So uh, that's <laughs> <important. laughs> yeah, okay. that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if BB belongs to LN1, then B is continuous. So you know that if BB, belongs to Ln plus something, then D is a bit continuous. Of something that depends on epsilon and goes to C. So what is the limiting case of this? It is certainly not Ln, but it's Ln1. It's a logarithmic improvement of Ln. Lorentz space. Right? It's a Lorentz space. So 
And then it's uh, essentially uh, you, you prescribe that the level sets grow slow enough to make this, uh, this integral converge. The, okay, uh, decay fast enough. Uh, and this is an example of a Lorentz function. So it's, you correct the log. That's what you do. Because uh, if this is in LN, then it is in DMO. And the difference between DMO and L infinity is always a log. And then you shift the log from the left to the log from the outside. And this always works because elliptic problems are steep. Corollary, which is equivalent, uh, it is actually this way. <laughs> yeah. Any perturbation works in elliptic field. That I read the statement now. Yeah. Non linear with that statement. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, corollary, since LN are interpolation spaces, if the Laplacian is in LN1, the second derivative is in LN1, you apply the theorem and you get the nearest optimus. Okay, corollary of uh, the previous result, actually an improvement of the previous result, but that contains the same ingredient, is the following non-linear uh, Stein theorem. That's another manifestation of Weyasma's conjecture. You see now the right-hand side doesn't depend on P, and here is continuous. Okay, this is actually a corollary of another result, which is the following one. We know that if the risk potential is bounded, then the gradient is bounded. If it's bounded by, you, by um, absolute continuity of integral, it goes to zero pointwise. But if it goes to zero uniformly, then the U is continuous. So you don't break, you don't break the continuity. Now the point is that if mu is in Ln, one, this condition is satisfied. No, no, the average is, is uh, n and downstairs. The average is n downstairs because this is a convolution with a uh, uh, with um, not a single but a fractional. Um, so if mu belongs to ln, ln one, then this condition is satisfied, and then you can consider that this. But this condition tells at a microscopic level how the the, the density of the measure of the right hand side measure influences the creation of the discontinuity to the gradient. So it, it's very much in the spirit of the classical potential theory by, uh, by, by Borello, Choquet, and so forth, and they did this for the Laplace. It's a, exactly their, their, their statement from the 30s, but now it's for any linear equation. And it's a general principle because you can do also in fully nonlinear equations using also a, a certain uh, different uh, different uh, notions of potentials, and we come to this later. And this is the end point of uh, Tudinger and Caffarelli's estimate, because if you look at Caffarelli's or Tudinger, they, they always have a length plus something and blah blah. blah. Now we go to the same thing. Actually, the proof for the fully nonlinear is much easier than for the pila plus because for fully nonlinear, you have to introduce Pucci's uh, operators as a uh, cardiac and each everybody. I mean, you linearize the problem. So you don't have to control the degeneracy of this thing. In the pila plus case, and in these kinds of the things, you have to control the degeneracy and how the degeneracy matches with the You want to go back? No, no, no. This is the only oh. first and only time. But we can make it. And on, on, on the potentials used, but not on this result. Ah, okay. But we can come back in any time. No, no, yes. Okay, but later is better because you will see the potentials that intervene. No, but then a quick question. Uh, are you going to use the, you are not going to use the Alexander? Are you? We are using all the elements in your book with Gasparelli. Yeah, yeah, but combining with, uh, with yeah, 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 but the Alexander of, uh, is, is, is used, uh, but you will use the Alexander of, of but for a length. We use the Scariata. Oh, we have an minus epsilon. Epsilon, and therefore we don't. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. That epsilon uh, uh, bit of the <laughs> rule that gives you, and you see, it's interesting because uh, essentially we we control uh, we control a risk potential. A risk potential means in its an infinity manifestation a maximal operator. Maximal operator is of the of the right hand side, which is uh, it, it's a sort of maximal operator of the right hand side, which is this. Okay. Now, if you if you act on this. Then you're done because it's like maximal operator in L1, and this is not bounded. But if you use this kind of yeah, so you have L1 plus F, and then you have you're But this is a very technical, uh, I mean, uh, 
but you caught it immediately because you know that what is the limiting case of ABP, and then you have to go a bit below. Otherwise, you don't. Uh, actually, this is a strength of the theory that uh, that we always embed the limiting case when you have a right hand side, having more room when you don't have a right hand side. Okay, now we go to non uniformly elliptic operators, and uh, it's like yesterday for those who were there. So I'm going to consider uh, integral functionals of this type. And this is the right hand side, this, this is the associated Euler equation, but uh, why not consider in general uh, solutions here? Okay. Ellipticity is described by saying that the lowest eigenvalues is always positive and it's bounded from below by a certain function of the gradient and above by a second function of the gradient. Not negative. Always positive, I think. Positive. It's just non-negative. Non negative, you are correct. But uh, we can allow also for uh, for positive. Just zero, just zero. It's okay. So it's interesting. You think positive? Well, it's positive. Uh, yeah, not negative. Ah, okay, you are correct. <laughs> okay. Okay, uniform ellipticity means that uh, it's uh, as I told yesterday that this quantity stays bounded. And since we are looking at when the gradient is large, we can confine ourselves to check that this is uh, uh, satisfied when the gradient is very large, because if the gradient is small, it's automatic. Anyway, you can take any Z is as small as the same. That, that is not the core of the problem. So this is the, uh, this is the so-called ellipticity ratio, and, it's, and it intervenes everywhere in ellipticity. For instance, in motion pair, it's the distortion of these ellipsoids. So anytime you can control the ratio between the these eigenvalues, you can do a certain number of classical things. And you cannot do it if they do are. So this is the definition of uniform ellipticity. Non-uniform is then is when this doesn't happen, at least for one point. And one point for us is a lot because dependence is always continuous on X. So one point means a lot of positive measures. Okay. So this is the classical definition, and this is a classical topic studied uh, by all these people, for instance. Gilbert, Finn, Tudinger, Serin in the West, in the East, there was the St. Petersburg School, and like Jenska, Rats, like Vodkin, Oskolkov, Ivanov. It's a classic, very classical topic. And more recent stuff is from Zhikov. Ivanov and especially Marcellini, and Marcellini was able to give a certain number of very non trivial local estimates. I'll come to this later on. Okay, so I'm going to, cons I'm going to fix, uh, I'm going to consider especially um, the variational setting because the formulations are easier in the variationals. Okay, I'm more natural. All the estimates are the same, but the approximations at the end leads to more natural statements in the sense. And uh, this is just the repetition uh, of what I said before, adapted to the Euler Lagrange equation case. Okay, so if you look at all the literature, there's a competition starts, uh, st that is starting right now. So you want to prove that the gradient is bounded. In the classical uniformly elliptic setting, you use that this quantity is bounded, and it's okay. But if this quantity starts growing up, then you lose this quantity, and then there's a competition because you use that this quantity is bounded to prove that the gradient is bounded, but when the gradient starts being large, this also starts being large. So this uh, competition is resolved in favor of regularity uh, when there is such a, uh, an assumption. That is, the ratio grows like a small power of the gradient. So if you blow up like a small power of the gradient in the, in the polynomial non-uniformly elliptic regime, then you can still prove a certain number of things. So this is a bound on the fact that if this grows too much, then you lose regularity. So in any place in the literature, everybody has his own notions, assumptions, and whatever, but up to, let's say, conformal transformations, everything boils down to assume what you have to assume, that uh, you cannot grow too fast. In particular, if you are in the so-called PQ setting in the, in the terminology of Marcellini, which is uh, also you can find in the literature, in the, some Russian literature and so forth, 
you have a P growth, P minus two growth on the lowest eigenvalue, Q minus Q growth. So this is bounded by this object and the Q cannot be too far apart from it. This is the, the, this is the classical definition given by Marcellini in the setting of functionals that they have peak coercivity in Q bound. So if you scale by two, you get this. So I would like to concentrate now on this setting, P and Q, like, uh, um, and this is the setting. So this is a, and this is a, uh, uh, this is a, a, a simple result that tells you what is the status. You get these kinds of functionals. The ratio cannot be too far apart from one. Otherwise there are minimizers that are even unbounded. And this depends on n. There are pioneering papers of Marcellini that are here and I do that. And okay, these are examples of functionals with PQ growth. This is still uniformly elliptic, by the way, but as PQ growth polynomial. Um, this is, was considered by Talenti, so you oscillate between two growths according to the gradient. Uh, this is considered by Uyaltsen and Udaletova, but even before in St. Petersburg, and then later by Zhikov, and uh, also in the setting of nonlinear elasticity, every derivative grows, grows with its own exponent. So if you, for instance, take a, a material, right, and you reinforce the material, like uh, when you put some uh, some um, some strips of steel in the in the um, in, 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 in the bricks, and then uh, if you stretch in this way, you feel one exponent. Right? If you stretch in the other way, you feel the, the steel. So there are two different arguments. And then you can go very far by adding x x x x. It was considered by Duke and Els in harmonic maps. Liebem and Marcellini, Craig Evans in the setting of KAM theory to approximate infinity of Laplacians. So theoretically speaking, it should be easier to, to prove that these uh, objects are the minimizers are Lipschitz because you're penalizing a large area. Technically it's not because this doesn't satisfy the delta two condition. So as, as soon as you go a perturbation inside the, the exponential, you lose integrity. Because uh, you know that if X for F is integrable, X for two F is not. I mean, you don't necessarily know that that's too much. That's that's too much. Sorry. I mean, you, if you get that X of a function is X is L1, this is not guaranteed anymore. So a small perturbation, and even this is not guaranteed, even one plus one. So any, so any, so, any, so and this means that every time you do some estimates, you run into trouble. Problems. But still, you can cover these. Yeah, yeah, we can cover now this way. This, this can be covered because uh, essentially you are using intrinsic structures that unify everything. Now, now you'll see this. Okay, but this is a model result by Mancini. P, Q, P, Q, as before, non degenerate to make things simple. And uh, if this is true, then du is bounded and you have this a priori estimate. When p is equal to q, this is like du to the q, and this is one over q is the, is the classical and p and infinity estimate. Otherwise, it is something that uh, expon whose exponent blows up when you reach the, the borderline case. Mm -hmm. uh, for these autonomous functionals, the best bound is not known, so there's always been research about that. For instance, these are recent uh, results by Bell and Schaffner. Schaffner, Hirsch and Schaffner, this is the optimal bound for an infinity. It's a nice paper by Hirsch and Schaffner. And then there is this paper uh, by the Philippis Christensen and Koch using some duality to improve it under some special assumptions. But this is just to give you uh, a flavor of what's going on there. Um, okay. So let me recall this uh, nonlinear non Stein theorem. So we have seen that even in the in the vectorial case, if you get a system whose right hand side is near one, then du is continuous and therefore is locally bound. Here I'm interested in the locally bounded case because when uh, the gradient is bounded, then you go back to the uniformly elliptic regime and you can readapt more easily known techniques. Otherwise, techniques must be continued. 
Okay, so in, in a certain sense, this is a universal condition for any equation. So is this a universal condition also in the non-uniform Lebesgue setting? So this is the question. Um, okay, a first result is about the autonomous case. We take this class of functionals. The control now doesn't depend on X on the eigenvalues, it's G1 and G2. And the crucial assumption is that the ratio, there's a balancing condition that says that the ratio, the ellipticity ratio, is bounded by a certain power of this function. The power is a small power. Um, what is this function? So in the classical Pila Plasian case, Gs is S to the P minus two. So this is nothing but S to the P. Okay, under this assumption, we can prove the following result. Tell that tells that this is a, a very uniform, a very universal condition, also in the non-uniform regime. And we have this a priori estimate. This also holds in the vectorial case once you have the so-called Ulenbeck structure. Uh, why do we have this strange uh, uh, shape of the left hand side? Because essentially this is the natural quantity that, uh, that, the, co that the coercivity of the problem uh, is based on. Is corresponding to G1 over G2? Or no, G2 no, no. Okay, G1 okay. No, this is a yeah, main G2 assumption. G2 over, this is yeah. the main assumption. So G2 over G1. Yeah, yeah. Are bounded like this. The power. The small power. Plus and plus. The small power, right? Small power, yeah. A certain power depending on and and it, it gets small when n is large. Okay, recent related results with uh, with an improvement of this delta number are given by Bell and Schaffner uh, in advanced in Kalkbar and by up to the boundary. And that, uh, also the, the first result has been extended up to the boundary by Christiana Definitivis and Mirko Piccini. They are both in part. Um, okay, uh, so how do we get this? Is that uh, as as far as I know, it's for the first time that we use nonlinear potential theoretic approaches uh, in these kinds of non uniform settings. And essentially, what we do is what is implicit in, in the uniformly elliptic setting. We again reduce these kinds of problems to the uniformly elliptic case, even to the Poisson case, in a sense. It covers essentially all the previous results. Okay. In the classical case, because this also covers the classical case, when you take G1 comparable to this, then equal to C or C equal to anything. Then the previous estimate that looked out is the classical one. In the in the PQ case, you get back to much in the estimates. Mm -hmm. So this obviously bad uh, bad looking estimate uh, returns to you in the class in the classical form. Mm -hmm. And you can also extend this by a different kind of techniques also to the non autonomous case. And this is the first paper with Cristiana de Filippis. Uh, okay, the previous results are with Lisa Beck. And these results that are completely non trivial with respect to the others are with Cristiana de Filippis. And you can also consider the case of differentiable coefficients and considering exponential growth assumptions. So, why this is non trivial? Because you see, at this point, usually these are. Uh, obtain via perturbation methods, but you cannot do any perturbations because if, if you move a bit inside the exponential, then you lose all kinds of integrability properties. So you have to rely on uh, more specific structures. And in fact, this is why I was using this formulation because in the exponential, this covers also the exponential, this kind of assumption mm -hmm. covers this exponential. Sure. And uh, in this case, we are also able to take non-differentiable coefficients, but just in W1D. And D must be larger than N in a sense that this is Hilbert continuous. Otherwise, you would have you would get too much. But any kind of Hilbert continuity is uh, is, uh, 
is assumed, and this also works in the vectorial case. I don't agree with your terminology of normal functions. No, no, normal is when there is no x. Yeah, but they don't have x. By the way, you should call constant transitions for everyone. Yeah. I, I probably agree, but you see, in the literature, they also they always talk, tell about no, oh, yes. no, yeah, Ooh. it's every time. Oh, yes. Yeah, in the very not in the case of equations, in the in the variation or in the calculus of variations, no. when there is no axis, no, no, no. is when there is axis, no, no, no. Ah, in the calculus of variations. It's this is a standard. Ah, well, but that makes a bit of sense because x can when you make one dimension. Exactly. Yeah, like this comes from the one dimensional. This comes that from the one like dimensional like calculus yeah. of variation. Ah, so yeah. anytime you put coefficients, it's not normal. Yeah, but for a elliptic person, it should be. For a elliptic person, there should be constant coefficients. And then you can add any type of uh, any combination of exponential. So the rigidity of the structure and the approach works <laughs> to allow for any type of bad conditions and uh, inside coefficients. And this is always done via these potential theoretic techniques. In particular, going back to the general uniformly elliptic equation, uh, this is a, a result which is, uh, in some sense, orthogonal to those known. Uh, again, by Fuji and myself, uh, uh, we proved uh, also the following. We take the field attraction. Then we know that if we long to ln one, then this implies that u is continuous. Now you wonder if you have coefficients that are of course bounded away from zero to infinity, so they still make the problem elliptic. What is the rate of continuity that you need to prove just continuity? To prove elder continuity, you know that it's elder, but to prove it, then this is Dini continuity. Dini continuity means that if omega is the modulus of the beauty of this guy, this is finite and zero. On the other end, and this is sharp, even when p is equal to two, there's a counterexample by uh, Marziava and Sharp again. But on the other end, uh, we can do the following. We can, we can trade, we say, okay, we do not require that this is being continuous, but we take that this is differentiable and the derivative belongs to ln one. That doesn't guarantee that, uh, okay, if the derivative belongs to ln one, C is continuous, but not necessarily D continuous. So this is the, if you trade, you trade D continuity by differentiability and you still get the result. Okay, uh, we have applications for reasons to obstacle problems. You want to minimize this, in this class, and you want to find the best possible condition of the obstacle guaranteeing that the gradient is bounded for all these kinds of functions of the SCT, Q, this is already new for the field of Lashen case, but it's, it, it, it also works for the exponential. This is still the uh, uh, paper with the Christiana. And then the second derivatives of the obstacle must be in LA1. And this is sharp, you cannot get better than this. How this is done? Uh, you can use an old linearization procedure going back, I think, to the PhD thesis of Frank Buzar and also used by Martin Fuchs and by Martin Fuchs and myself later on. So you can write down the Euler equation in this, in this sense, which is in a sense in a trivial sense. <laughs> so, okay, uh, this means that the right hand side only lives on the contact set. Outside the contact set, it's zero. On the contact set, it's equality. This only works. This only works when the second, if you, if you, uh, if you carefully look at the, the original proof of the dudes and books, and this only works when the second derivatives are in LN one, but you are in the game because you are in LN one. You just need LN for this. So we do this. Now, this is bounded. Now you know that the second derivatives are bounded, so the gradient is bounded. And so the right hand side, you can develop the divergence here, and the right hand side is in ln one because these are the coefficients, this is bounded, and this is only secondary. So coefficients are, you see, in ln one. Mm -hmm. This is a 
irrelevant because it's bounded and these are secondary. So this is in an annual and you are in between. Because it's like a uh, uh, equation. Of course, you use the a priori estimates not for the function, for the equation, but then you go back to the function or to make the approximation scheme. Because what I didn't tell is that this, the a priori estimates you find here must be combined with the a priori scheme. So you always assume that the gradient is bounded by approximating the problem, and then you pass the gradient to the uniform estimates to this classic. Apply the previous results. Okay, now a shot. This is the second part of the talk. A shot, how we did it. Shot on how we did it. Okay. Uh, the ideas are essentially from these papers with major emphasis on the latest paper with Christiana de Filippis. And okay, so, so uh, just to, for the ease of exposition, I will uh, trade some generality with the ease of exposition. So the same approach can be carried out up to the very end to get uh, um, sharp results in all dimensions. But if you want to give a unified approach, uh, in some sense, in n, sometimes for n equal to two and two, three, we have to forget the result in the lower dimensions. But this can be replaced by refining the same approach. But just this is just to give an idea. Okay, just for the sake of exposition. Okay. So, what do you mean that you are going to assume n? And yeah, uh, you will see. Okay, let's say for uh, from from five to yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. then you can. Make a, a bit of a correction. Okay, let me start. So, uh, uh, okay, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pass from linear. I'm going to show the same approach from linear, uniform, and therefore uniformly elliptic in the sense, to nonlinear, uniformly elliptic, and then to nonlinear, non uniformly elliptic. I want to show always the same approach. Okay, the easiest possible case, linear equations with measurable coefficients. So you are in the regime of the George Nash-Moser theory, but for the fact that you have a right hand side. That's why Talenti is estimated at the center of the point. Okay, um, this is the standard Kachov polytyping equality. Which is satisfied. B minus k is the maximum between B minus k and zero. And this is the standard one. And this is what you get if you have a right hand side. The proof you just test by cut off, let's say, you over B minus k plus. And do the compute, do Young's inequalities and three lines. But okay, this is what it is. It's very classical. Okay, uh, what happens? Uh, in particular, we have this. This scales as it has to scale, dimensionally speaking, as the R2 if you scale the dish. And when f is equal to zero, this is this one. From this, then you observe that uh, if B solves the equation minus B solves the equation, sub and super solution, then you apply the George's iteration from this, and you get the classical and infinity R2 estimate from one ball to the double ball. No surprise up to up to now. Okay, this is when f is equal to zero. Sure. Any level, any level. In the majority equation, you can use every level. I mean, uh, no, I would you need every level. You need to capture every level. Yeah, but then to reduce the last line, you need to, you need to, to use uh, different level. Actually, you have to use this for b and to minus b. Yes, because this only needs the sub bound. Then, to get the lower bound, you should do minus b. Okay. okay, shot number three. Now we recall what are these monsters. There's a general uh, Lorentz space. Okay, you don't really want to go no. into this, right? <laughs> but you trust that the first index dominates. The second index refines the first, okay. modulus the lock, and the, the, the monotonicity in the two index is reversed. These are the three things. That I is what it is. This is what it is. This is your, the end. When the two index are, are the same, 
So it's like they, they mention to the day uh, when they are missing. Okay, this is what it is. The first nominating is that it can be or less. Yeah, I said the second is a is a fine timing of the first going into the right uh, into the other direction. Good. This is what it is. It's a potential. <laughs> then one, of course, might wonder why I call it a potential. Call it as you like. Easter egg. It's okay, but it's a potential. Uh, you will see why. Okay, now we are all look, looking puzzled. <laughs> and uh, uh, why is this a potential? <laughs> because for this choice, this is the risk. Okay, potential. Huh? No, no, not another potential. <laughs> the potential. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Okay, 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 guides to the reading. This is the higher measure with respect to the product. Yeah. Higher measure with respect to the product. Anytime you see the higher measure, you are looking at the series, at a series. Okay. So this is a series. And the series is the D row of a row. The row of a row is a series in dynamic scale because it's, it's measure. So, so this means a sum. Yes. Of a series. Good. These are the, uh, the, 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 this measures the fine decay or the growth at, at one point. It is modulated by this object. Very good. But the, 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 how the parameters fit, uh, skip at the first week. <laughs> okay, but the important thing is that for this specific choice, you get back the classical risk potential. For this specific choice, you get back the classical having Mazian wolf potentials. These are the classical uh, wolf potentials used, used in nonlinear tools. Otherwise, they need a fan using nonlinear potential here. There's a large, uh, I mean, in theory, starting from having a Mazia at the beginning of the 70s. Um, uh, in all the other cases, you get a, a larger family of potentials, and these are the ones used for, to do this fully nonlinear result, for instance. So we just enlarge the set of, of parameters. Okay, it's again what it is. If you are in this Lorentz space, then this potential is bounded. Don't try to make any guess on the experiments. It, it, it's again, it, it, it is what it is. It's a lemma. It's not very difficult to prove. It goes via rearrangements and characterization of uh, uh, of certain certain uh, averages via simulation and maximal operators, but it is what it is. Take it for granted. Rearrangements uh, and maximal operators, uh, because you're, okay, you take the Lorentz norm. You rewrite in here. You rewrite in uh, in the uh, uh, rearrangements. After that, you find that there's an equivalent quantity, which is the maximal operator in one dimensional case at zero over the rearrangement, and this can uh, this can be used to bound uh, these potentials. No, 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 no. This is just a computation. You don't use the uh, uh, just, just to prove the equivalence between the, the rearrangement and the maximum of the it's, it's essentially a maximum of the um, But in one dimension, yeah, it, it's a so called, uh, it's called a uh, rising sum lemma, which, which is classical, classical, which is Calderon's in one Which is Calderon's in one yeah, Calderon Sigmund is a generalization of Ries result for the Hilbert transfer. The Ries result is uh, from 47, in one dimension, it proves the boundaries of the Hilbert transfer, and does the rising sum lemma, which is again an exit sometime, uh, a sort of an exit by that. In fact, the classical theorem of uh, Calderon and Sigmund, uh, the classical paper is dedicated to Ries. Is he dedicated to Marcel Ries? I mean, if we want to go back to the this these are these freedoms over there. But the talk is recorded. <laughs> okay, this is what it is. It is what it is. Okay, and now we go back, we go back, and we uh, we give um, uh, this starts from Kilpenani and Mali, and, and after. That reread the George's uh, iteration proof, and then this is still reread according uh, a certain uh, certain manipulations that we did also in some papers with formal books. Okay, now assume that you have this. This is a reversal of the inequality. 
So if this object is not there, this is the reverse center inequality that you use to start this iteration mechanism in the Georgia direction. Otherwise, you have this guy. Now, the Georgia's iteration starts from B1 and you end up in B1 half or in an in intermediate form. Okay? Now you do it in another way. Instead of iteration, you do summation and you end up in one point. At one point, you get the estimate and then you get a potential. So this is, uh, this is the judge's iteration in terms of, of potentials. So, sorry, you are saying that the judge's iteration that is, that are, that is this reverse form and inequality. Okay, the reverse of the inequality, you always get here the judges. Yeah, sorry. You always get a reverse of the inequality in the judges. This is a reverse of the inequality plus an addition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the role of this additional term in this scheme, in this summation scheme is to get an L infinity bound at one point, but at one point means every point uh, when the right hand side is zero. And then the contribution of these guys uh, evaluated by this potential. But so they would say that, sorry, I'm yeah, mm -hmm. to understand. Uh, you say that the Georgi method, but this, this reverse holder is more rather from what, we, what you're using the Moser instead. No, 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 no. Yes. No. No, motor iteration, you change the power. You change, yes, the, you power. change the power. Yes. But also in the job, you change the power. Hey, I'm not saying but the motor is no, you and then you take uh, you take chi fix and you make t go to plus infinity. In motor. Motor. Yeah, here you fix it. T. Ah, okay. You fix t. So explain to me, please. Yeah, in motor, a k is the sum of exponent. Kappa k kappa. is only okay. Here okay. it is what it is. Okay. It's something larger than one. T is fixed, take T equals to two, for instance, in the linear case. I see. As in your judge. Yes. And then you get this. This is L infinity, this is L2, and this is the contribution. And you iterate on, on the K, on the level. Or something. Um, you, you have to move the level, but you have to make a, a, a delicate iteration, and at the end, you have to sum up. Because, yeah, yeah but you're you're the level, summation of the levels. Um, okay. no, not really on the differences. Oh, yeah. Look, at, this is a very fine point because yeah. this is an intermediate. This is an intermediate state between the first and the second lamp of the judge. Because in the same, in the first lamp, you just go straight away. Yes. In the in the se in the first lamp, in yeah. the second lamp, you cut, you, you cut and slice, yeah. right? Right. And, uh, uh, and, and you need a measure to create the Hilbert continuity. Here you do, you cut and slice, but you don't get the, the, the log uh, measure lemma. And so you end up with L infinity, but with a more precise control of, of, the, remainder, of the remainder terms that create asymptotically the potential. Okay. Again, this lemma is what it is. Okay. Now take the now we go along the classical scheme, which is more familiar to you. Take the Kachopol inequality. Take the reverse inequality. This is the Sobolev embedding. This is of now of the type we have seen before. We apply the lemma and we get this. When this is bounded, when this is finite, and this is the sharp result of parity, but in a local fashion. And must be larger than uh, than uh, the linear uh, value. And this is what the length group with your This is what the length group. Uh -huh. But uh, up to the boundary, because he has to have a neutral boundary. It doesn't work for local estimates. He doesn't know Okay, this is a first example in the most familiar situation. Second example. Now we go to a hybrid Kachopol inequality. Now we go to the G2, G1 as before. G1 is this guy and G2 is this guy. So we, have, we are in the PQ case as before. Now we, we see how this works <laughs> to the nonlinear case. Okay, in the nonlinear case, what is the okay? What is the point in the previous lemma? 
The point is in the previous lemma is that if you look at this quantity, this inequality is homogeneous in B. You see B grows like T here and uh, T here. And that's why you can iterate. Uniform ellipticity means that all estimates are homogeneous and therefore you can iterate. So this lemma works as long as you can iterate. If you go in the and uh, if you go to the non-uniform elliptic setting, uh, this never happens uh, because you have two different exponents and therefore estimates are never homogeneous. Therefore, these lemmas are out of this out of the game. But look at what we can do now. We can force, we can have a, a, a so-called hybrid catch-up for the board. We assume that we are in a ball where this is controlled by M. And then we write down this catch up for inequality for du to the P. So this is Bernstein method. Bernstein method tells that du to the P is a subsolution. If it's a subsolution, then it satisfies a catch up for inequality, then you iterate and you prove that it's bounded. Here is not a subsolution, so you write down the catch up for inequality. But the catch up for inequality is not homogeneous. So you force it to be homogeneous with respect to the iterating quantity, paying the price of the ellipticity ratio outside and paying in the worst possible way, L infinity. Okay. So otherwise, because this is the first attempt to, to prove the lemma. Okay, now we go, but since Professor Cabret is in the audience, I will put a few more detailed remarks. Good. No, because if I put this, uh, the following remarks to general audience, I will speak, I mean, I'll love it. But if I, uh, now this can be understood, <laughs> at least by someone. Okay. okay, now you see, we force the Bernstein method to be homogeneous in a non homogeneous setting, PQ, by putting this outside. And now, of course, uh, uh, we would like to prove uh, this. What is the problem with this? The problem is that, of course, the constants, the control of the constants is lost, because if you want to bound DD, then uh, you have an inequality where d d d u is a, is appearing on the right hand side, and so at this stage there is nothing to do because otherwise you would have treated non-uniform elliptic problems as it, as they were uniform elliptic. But now we do something that is never done in the literature. Maybe it's some sort of a desperate move, but it's not so desperate. So Nina suggests to carefully look at the constants. <laughs> so we go to the lemma and we prove a refined version of the lemma and observe that if these are the constants appearing here, these are the constants appearing there. Okay, why is this working? Uh, because essentially you're applying this intermediate lemma of the Georges between the second lemma. Because the, second, the first lemma, the L infinity, if you, if you carefully study the thing in the first lemma, the constants depend polynomially. If you go to the second lemma, the constants depend exponentially because they pass to this log lemma or to the slice and you get to the dynamic slice. Yes. So we, can, we should not go to the second lemma, but we should have a, an intermediate version of the second. So we keep the polynomial control of the constants. So this is usually never done, but you keep the constants. Okay, how we do? How do we conclude here? This is the inequality. So we apply the previous lemma. Oh, sorry. We apply now the improved version, the, quanti uh, the quantitative version of the previous lemma, with the following choice: tack, tack. Okay, and we get this. Therefore, we get this. So we still have to get rid of the red quantities. So we compute everything. And now we do the following. This is pointwise. Now we take one ball, we take E1, E1 out. B tau one, B tau two,
and we apply in each point of theta one with a radius which is uh, proportional to theta one. So never escape the target. So we apply the pointwise inequality. Huh? Along this skin. And this is an infinity on beta 2. So we get this. Okay, now we require that these powers are less than one. Now we apply Yang's, and then we conclude with this level. And these are bounds of the type that are required. In this setting, because when Q is equal to P, you see this is satisfied. When Q is equal to P, this is satisfied. I think you made something that was uh, exponential for the parameter. Uh, sorry for the your geometric. Uh, now to make it polynomial. And because you don't apply the slicing here. Uh, no. no. Slicing on any on, uh, on level or on radius? Or Not on levels. Levels, okay. Levels and radius are always side by side. But now. What do you mean side by side? When you move yeah. the radius, yeah. you always move the radius. You, you move them at the same time, right? Then you shrink up to the point. Yeah. You move them at the same yeah, time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And now, and now, what are you saying? Now, what do you do? Because you never use the log length. You see, the, the log length is the, is the thing that tells you that the, the, log the, le the log length of most. That, uh, that, uh, no, we are speaking about the George. Hmm. But this no, is the George. No, no, but this is the judge. The log lemma says that uh, if you want to reduce uh, the measure, uh, you know that uh, this is, let's say, minus three. Yes. Yeah. If you want to reduce on nu, then you have to go to this. So the, the, the dependence would give an exponential dependence. Okay. And this is linked to the fact that there are Technically speaking, yes. You don't use this. You compute, and this is what you get. You get a polynomial dependence because you don't get. A, you see, this is not an oscillation inequality. As long as you do not want the Hilbert continuous dependence, you go, so this stops before. And you mean that you stop before? The series. I no, mean, no, no, no. The iteration goes up to the very end, but it provides you an infinity. If you look at the two lemmas of the geology, in the first lemma you prove that the solution is an infinity, mm -hmm. and in the second lemma you prove the reduction of the oscillation. In the first lemma, the dependence of the constant is polynomial. Okay. In the second lemma, I said, and this is an infinity as well, so it's not polynomial. It's not exponential. It's polynomial because you are not doing the the order. And uh, because you are not doing exactly uh, exactly this scheme that would lead uh, an exponential worst and eventually lead to the end. It's a very it's a very a uh, yeah you do a little less. Yeah, it's very it very bad. and you have to do the computations. But what, which method, which, which idea do you use, like the George? No, the George corrected with this nonlinear potential theory uh, ideas. That have been developed, developed or in the literature for, for many years. You have to know where to put your hands and hope that things at the end, at the end work. But then at the end, you get this. And this is uh, the first time that I know that studying the dependence of the constants leads to every, everything you like. Um, and then you apply this classical lemma of Jacob de Juice, it's an iteration. Uh, okay, this is for autonomous problems, uh, and you see the catch up on inequality is that the derivative of the gradient, so second derivative is formal. When you have other continuous coefficients, uh, this is not the case, and this is the uh, at, at the roots of the proof of the of the, of the shadow estimate system. So, what do you do when you have other continuous coefficients? When you do other continuous coefficients, you observe that now you you do not want to have the full derivatives, but fractional derivatives. Mm -hmm. So you use Gallardo norms in the following sense. And you can prove 
or equations of this type with their continuous dependence, you read their continuity as a sort of fractional differentiability. So you use no local methods in local problems. And what you get is a Cacciopoli type inequality of the previous kind, but now you have a fractional derivatives. And now the situation worsens because you don't have a contribution of the right hand side, but of the equation itself. And there will be a subtle manipulation of, the, of, of all these quantities. So there will be these objects, and these are, let's say, heavy exponents. Okay, now you see you have a, a fractional derivative of u to the p controlled by these objects. And now you apply fractional embedding and chi is not n over n minus two anymore, but it's n over n minus two beta. But any geometric generation is leading you to the, to the energy. And now you see, this is the core result, but before presenting this result, I wanted to present the other results. So the, 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 just to, to take your end by end to the, the, to the last scheme. So first uniformly, then go uniformly, and then uh, the final uh, Hilder coefficients. Now you have uh, this fractional catchopoly. Now you do fractional embedding. And now you can use the previous lemma to get that the gradient is bounded along the previous scheme. Uh, and finally, something which is philosophically in parallel. Okay, this is as not uh, this is just to give um, a full overview. Okay, we have seen what that uh, via. Uh, okay. What we have seen is that you can control the dependence of the constants along the iteration. So you get rid of the non uniform elliptic. So the method is the following you, for, you take the Cachopo inequality in the non uniform elliptic case, you force it to be homogeneous by paying this price, and then you control the constants along the iteration. And the methods used is the judge. And now we come to the, to the, to the thing that. Uh, uh, that's it. Adier was talking about before. If you do something with the judge, you should be able to do something in the same spirit with most of Okay. Okay. Now, this is, as an a priori estimate, a result that is uh, known in the literature. Now we have uh, uh, differentiable coefficients, so no Hilder coefficients. We have a functional with P and Q, differentiable coefficients. Okay. And this bound, ah, what I forgot to tell you is that uh, you, you saw this strange dependence of the constants uh, imposed at the end. So uh, um, amazingly enough, this is the same bound that you get here, uh, the methods of Bachelini and the So you go, so for the, the methods for the, for the non autonomous space, for the exponents. For the exponents. So, uh, so you actually don't, so. The thing works up to the very end, so it gets you the same things. But now we want to do a similar thing via Moses, okay? Yeah. And there's nothing new in the result, but in the method of proof. Okay, this result is known that if you have these differentiable coefficients, and then you get uh, you get the view is bounded. Okay, now we want to do uh, now we want to explain a method that allows you to prove this only knowing the case p equal to q. So only knowing the uniformly elliptic case. Okay. Um, so so we, we concentrate, and this is the last thing I'm going to explain, we concentrate on the case p equal to q. In the case p equal to q, you can run Moses technique. And if you carefully compute the constants in Moses techniques, you see, now the ratio between the eigenvalue is just L because P is equal to Q. If you carefully compute uh, Moses technique, you end up with this, with this explicit depends on L. Okay. This is going back to the proof and checking the constants. And this is the same type. So what kind of uh, dependence of, of this? 
is this is it still exponential is still uh, polynomial because because you are proving an end infinity estimate so whenever you go into an infinity the, the dependence is polynomial okay okay now we take b tau 2 and on b tau 2 we can write down the pq growth conditions in the following sense so we force the q growth from above to be p and pull out an infinity to, to this so this means you are in the previous scheme but replacing l by this point okay now this is a simple observation it's a trivial yeah? And now you apply the uniformly elliptic theory. You get this. Okay. So again, the problem is that this is also on the right hand side. But now you prescribe that this is less than one. You apply Young, and this is less than one when the sharp bound is known bound is considered. Now you, you do this, and you conclude with the same method. So this is a, uh, let's say, uh, a fast proof of how to reduce general non-uniformly elliptic equations to uniformly elliptic equations based on the fact that the dependence of the constants is polynomial when you prove an infinity estimate. And uh, this is the a priori estimate you get, which reduces to the usual one when, uh, when p is equal to p. So you don't lose anything. This is the magic one. So if you really look at the point where nobody looks at it, you find the treasure over there. And I think it's okay. how do you prove it and this is uh, several pages uh, this is several pages because uh, uh, um, you see if you have a fractional problem then proving such an estimate is two lines because you test and you get it and now you have a problem which is not differentiable so you cannot differentiate the problem so what we do is a uh, is a general scheme devised uh, in another setting by Christian and myself, and as a starting point. So uh, do you know a bit the, the dynamic decomposition in atoms of uh, these sort of functions, right? So in the dynamic uh, decomposition, you do two things. You first decide the scale of H. Let's say. And then you end up over, uh, let's say, actually, this is M, this should be put here. And then for every N, M. you divide M. M. And this is H, right? You divide a grid. You divide your space in a grid. The mesh of the grid is n is uh, two is one over two n. Getting a rent or sorry. No, no. No, 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 no. You are not in a rent. Okay. Yeah. For it, yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> oh, no. So I mean, all you no, 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 it's 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 okay. okay. It's okay. No, it's okay. That's a scheme. Okay. Then uh, then on each one, on each one of the, this is the standard decomposition of this. On each one, we put, uh, let's say, a bump function, which is called, which is called an atom. Uh, and this proper, this function has a property, uh, something like uh, that f and its derivatives are bounded by its averages and they scale accordingly, like an harmonic function. So k is one of, uh, let's say, uh, d, d over k, something like this. And then you put a these are a i n, these are the atoms, and then you put coefficients a i n. And then if you if these are decaying in a suitable way, this is okay. What is this about? This is the pullback of little root value. The pullback little root value is then when you take the frequency space and you 
take the annuli. And then you take a cutoff. Every annuli is a decomposition. So every annuli is a piece of this. And then you, if you go back, right in, in, in the space is this. Okay. This is commonly used, for instance, in, uh, in uh, dispersive equations and so forth, because it allows you to do some Fourier analysis in a way. What is Fourier analysis? <laughs> and of course, this is the localization. Fourier is like when you do this, and wait like this when you do this. <laughs> and then you really break into it. And then you choose the wave uh, which is most suitable to you, that is, you choose the atom. So uh, the more, the better are the wavelets, the, uh, the better are the atoms or the, the sample wavelets. And the, uh, okay, you choose the, wave, the wavelets, the change, uh, the sample wavelet according to what you have to do. But all this is linear. And uh, if, you, if you apply nonlinear problems, this makes no sense. So the idea that we have is to do is to do the following. We prove BS of estimates and BS of spaces is when a function, uh, let's say in M, begins as H to the alpha M, and this is BS of infinity M alpha. Okay. okay. Now H is the size of the difference. H, this is at x plus h minus x. These measures, when you are here, the rate of oscillation and the decay according to this constant. Okay, what do we do? We, uh, we, uh, we take the space, so the physical space, not the frequency space. Take this, take h, like here, you decompose in a certain in a thing that is h to the beta zero. Beta zero is less than one for technical reasons, but consider that it's proportional to this. Now, on each one, we do not consider a fun function which is an harmonic function or an atom in this sense, but we take a function which is a solution to a frozen problem. Now, why solutions to frozen problem take people to do, for instance, should be good because they satisfy this. Because Kachopoli, this is Kachopoli inequality. Kachopoli inequality. Is nothing but the second derivative of this by h to the beta b, and the size of this is this. But if you are shrinking and you take the averages, this is like a point class. So on each on each one of these guys, you have a good estimate. So we repatch up using bump functions. And the Hilbert continuity of coefficients is because when you uh, when you compare your solutions to this bump function, then you get a decay, which is the rate of Hilbert continuity. Then h appears here on every one on each one of the Diaby scale. You sum up this and you can, and you take the estimate on the whole space. But if you have the estimate on the whole space, then you are in this. So this is a non-linear root, uh, a non-linear little root technique in space. About the non-linearity, as you were saying, there is something. And the non-linearity, and the non-linearity is the following thing: if you want to compare any function to your original solution, you don't go anywhere. But if you compare a solution to a frozen problem to your solution, you get uh, in the scale in the because it, you see it's like freezing, but not in the real scale, scale, in the place of scale, in the in the little very very So the idea is that we do what uh, uh, what you should really do: you micro localize the problem, and a problem with the continuous Hilbert uh, coefficients look like a constant coefficient, but we do not measure this difference in the in the Hilbert scale, so in any case, not but in the of scale, and then you go back. Once, and this is done to construct the Kachopoli inequality. Once that you have the Kachopoli inequality, then you go back. Because you see, when you when you move with PDEs, there are essentially two ingredients you are using. In the dispersive world, and this this kind of approach, you uh, you make dyadic analysis everywhere. And you hammer with, the, with, with with atoms and dyadic scales and so forth. What is the what is the, the, the point here? The point is that if the problem is not linear, then it's uh, very often not okay. In so the you're... other, in the in the world that we know, in the world, let's say, of energy estimates, what you do is you get energy estimates and then you manipulate the integration by parts. Integration by parts is essentially the addition and uh, 
And now we combine the two approach. Up to a certain scheme, we do the dynamic approach to control the BASOF decay. After BASOF, we go back to a usual catch up on inequality and we, we, uh, we start with the geometric. So, is it possible that then what you are saying is that uh, for each sum, you can you throw the coefficients uh, given by one of the squares, right? Mm -hmm. Left. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. and then at the end what you do these frozen solutions, mm -hmm. you could soon sum them up mm -hmm. and you would I would have got nice control. Mm -hmm. And then are you like saying that more maybe you don't read exactly like this, but that that then that then this sum of uh frozen coefficients is not far from the from the from the original okay one. okay let's be more let's be let's be more suggestive let's be more suggestive let's be more suggestive what we are doing is the following thing you take the solution right no, but would they send make sense or yeah this is essentially what we are, we are doing okay so explain okay what we do is the following you take this one okay I think it's it's nice to 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 go a bit into this because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this looks of obscure to many people. And one of the one of the key points. <laughs> okay. that, uh, look at, here, there are many key points okay, okay, okay. because these then you have to to many. I mean, there are many key points. Okay, <laughs> okay. what you do is the following: thinking. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so what is a piezo function? A piezo function is something that, uh, that does this. So wow. let's say P, yeah, right. mm? and PK is like uh, HPI. In this sense, you are in piezo of um, Q infinity alpha. Okay, let's call it uh, alpha Q infinity for the joy of the. Uh, uh, when uh, this is uh, P, this is W alpha P. Huh? Okay. And this must, uh, this must happen for every H. Okay. So every H means that you are controlling the difference, uh, uh, the, the smaller H is, and the smaller uh, you are uh, getting the, the, the behavior. Okay. Now, Imagine that you do this. You fix a scale. Oh, sorry. Okay. You fix a scale, okay? Now you make a dyadic decomposition of the space. And for technical reasons, you cannot take the same H. You have to take H to the theta for a certain theta. This wasn't a bit the things, but. Uh, but it uh, still equals. Okay, on each one of these problems, then you get uh, a solution. The uh, 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 then here, this is the solution of the frozen coefficients. Okay. Be with the same boundary. Okay. With the same boundary. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Now. Uh, once you, once you do this in a sense, okay, in a very, very sloppy sense, uh, and of course, how many are these? These are h to the minus beta n. And this is the real n. Yes. Now this is the real n. So up to now, it's a minus beta k n. 2 to the k n, okay? Bj, then we do Bj. So this is the dyadic decomposition. Of course, this means that this is of order one to the k. If you sum up over all k, this means that you are saturating all the h's, and this becomes a double sum, and these are the atoms, and this is equivalent to the piece of decomposition. But this only works for minimizers for solutions. Yeah. So you have to combine. So this uh, for uh, this holds for any Sobolev uh, function when you use any atom. In this sense, it only holds for solutions because only solutions are close to themselves when you freeze. Yeah. 
So the phasing is reduced to the minimal status for the proof of the ARG estimate. Once you have the ARG estimate, then you, you go back and you use. So you go back and forth between the two methods. And so this also reveals the, let's say, a universal nature of the, of the Schauder theory. Because when coefficients are differentiable, then you apply, you differentiate, you use Moser, um, you use, uh, let's say, Bernstein methods, like here. And you get that the, the, the oh. Uh, because what okay i can do it a blackboard when uh, when there are no coefficients uh, what you have on the right on the left hand side of the catch up on inequality is the derivative of what of oh. u to the p because it must be there because it is a sub solution minus k uh, squared because actually what you use you raise u to the p You raise u to the p. Yeah, here it is. When there are no coefficients or when coefficients are Lipschitz. When you do there, you replace this by alpha. Okay. But replacing this by alpha is by no means, uh, it's, it's the real core of the proof because you have to go back and forth. Uh, uh, this uh, diadization method. Uh, uh, with atoms that are linked to the nonlinear problem. So, in, in my opinion, this is a general method, okay, a general philosophy that could be also used elsewhere. Because you see, the real point that uh, that, uh, that that has always made it possible to use certain radiatic approximations or decompositions in nonlinear problems is that you use abstract decompositions using any general atom. Here, you use atoms that are fitting to the nonlinear. And uh, this is the real thing. But this is one of the key points because then there are several, I mean, hidden things uh, uh, that you have to properly uh, manage. Uh, they are of the same type. It reminds me a little of some things that, uh, that the Schauder theory has done in the past. One was Caparelli's, for instance, theorems on. Uh, on um, ergodic, uh, remember the theorems on uh, no, 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 on, on those, those things he did with Rafael de la Llave on uh, yeah. when you had some uh, random, random, uh, fully non linear. But when was this? Well, the other thing I was going to say is homogeneous, homogeneous. yeah, or something. But uh, when was well, some result that at the end also applied homogenization, but they had some other estimates. But then I was going to say things that I, I saw in homogenization, where where you discretize and you freeze coefficients, uh, even from a linear problem. Uh, but this is Calderon system. Yeah, this no, is for Calderon I see. Maybe. And then you have to use, no, that it's different because then you have to uh, do what you do. Yes. Uh, okay, what you do with that method um, uh, uh, is a bit different because. Yes, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure, but just. No, 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 but the analogy is uh, yeah. correct. Why? Because essentially what Caffarelli does is that you take the exit time, okay, you take a mark, okay. Yeah, an exit time. Mm, okay. Uh, what he does is the following. Yeah. What he does is the following. He, this is kind of the literal. Ah, well, another thing. Yeah, it's uh, probably is based on this. The others are based on this. Uh, um, what you what he proves is uh, you take the line, okay, you take divergence A B U equals to uh, the divergence of uh, okay, call it uh, F to the B minus two or F, or actually he thinks this coefficient but the right hand side is the same, and then he has the, the maximal thing, right? Then this decays as, um, let's say, a certain power okay, uh, of the maximal uh, inequality at a lower level. And so this is a certain thing plus the maximal of f at a larger level. So what it does, um, uh, it, uh, it's a proof by contradiction. And this is a good lambda inequality. Then you integrate. So when you when you take when you take a pole where the exit time, let's say, is less than lambda, then this means that the pole 
you have a cube where the average is less than lambda, then you freeze and then you compare, and then you use the PKA estimate in L infinity of the reference problem. But this is done on the exit time cylinders. Now we do the dyadic decomposition with the different squashes on the different in fact, uh, uh, this is a paper that I studied very much because uh, uh, because this technique doesn't doesn't work for this when p is equal to two. And so there was a paper by Yashel and myself. Uh, I think it's in uh, Duke uh, zero seven, where we have a, a maximum function pre technique of uh, of this principle. So we do uh, directly the exit time argument. And on each exit time ball, we freeze the problem and we do compare. So this is, uh, but the analogy is okay. But here we do this at the level of the different, we do freezing at the level of the different scorches. Because of course, uh, uh, yeah, this actually was done even before that uh, in the Because essentially, both Chowder and Chowder and Sigmund are perturbation theorems. So you always have to refer to the zero to the to the to the frozen equations, but in this setting you cannot refer to the frozen equation doing uh, the comparison and the perturbation. You have to go you, you refer to this via this dyadic decomposition to build up the energy for you, and then you do the diet. It's uh, I don't think it's uh, you can do a, a lot uh, more than this. Linear there were some big first results or second results about the potential linear perspective by Dennis Labouti, right? For you, for you, for you, not for the grid. Not for the it's a paper by Labouti. Yeah. It's for it's also a new journal from zero two zero three, and the proof uh, uh, essentially uh, goes um, via the one of uh, Tuning and Wong. Yeah, because yeah. Tudinger and Wong did That's for the Phil Laplacian equation we did before. I see. Yes, and yes, then yes, Labouti yes. extended this uh, to, yes. the, to, the, to, to the to the to the case of uh, Asian. to the Asian. Yeah, but it's always for you. Here the point I, the point was to test from this because, for instance, uh, if you want to prove uh, a potential estimate, these are the difficulties. For instance, if you want to prove a potential estimate for this and mu is in that one. Right, so potential estimate means that you are bound in u less than the average plus the potential, and the potential is the the real object. Take p to equal to u. Mu is not there. This is a gradient estimate. So anyway, you have to differentiate the equation, yeah. but you cannot differentiate the equation because this is in L one and blah, blah. so. What do you do? Uh, what uh, what uh, what I proved many years before is that if you have an equation with measure data, take p equal to two, you don't have this, and you don't have this, uh, right? You don't have first derivatives. So when you have equations with okay p equal to two, measure data, so the the natural energy space is not L two, that's below, let's say L one, right? So the gradient cannot be in L1, in W11. So there are no second derivatives. So you cannot differentiate, you cannot do. But what I proved many years ago, I think, almost 20 years ago, is that you can prove this. So once you can prove this, and this was done around in 2005, 2006, and that. Once you can prove this, you can build up a Cachopoli type inequality, which is fractional. One. Yes. And this you do via dyadic decomposition. And uh, sorry, this is uh, uh, sigma. Sigma, yeah. Let's, let's write it down as it is. We roll out sigma one. One we roll out. And uh, of course, uh, this is average. This is one and this is first. 
because it's scale, right? Um, okay, this is what you can prove. This was done almost now 20 years ago or whatever. Once you write down the, this dyadic scheme, you can run a fraction of the Georgie work. In fact, uh, at the same time, there was this paper by Gaffarelli and Basser where they, in my opinion, this is the right approach, uh, uh, not the extension one, because the extension one, uh, of course, it was the, okay, it was the first approach and so forth, but the extension one, uh, uh, you see, I have a fractional problem, so I go back to the, to the, to the, to the safe, uh, regime uh, and uh, I pay at the generation and I go via Mac and Mac. The, the, the right approach is to argue directly with the uh, existence. Uh, the difference, of course, is that uh, this is a no local fractional inequality for a local problem, so you don't have a pain. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the fractional inequality for the fractional problem comes in one line you just test it. This is a uh, hell, some sort of hell. And then once you get this, uh, once you get this inequality by by potentials, then you do uh, this. So in a sense, you 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 use a large flexibility of elliptic problems towards all possible scales of fractional problems to 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 try to get. <laughs> but the idea is always the same: that if you want to do an infinity iteration, you need a geometric iteration. So any small exponent uh, will work. In fact, uh, what I proved always for p equal to two in this case, and then in other papers, is that. Uh, Uh, you cannot be here, but you are here on every sigma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for p equal to two. Otherwise, we prove other things. Okay. Uh, 